So you may have realized that Kevin and I know each other, and that's because Kevin was on my PhD advisory panel at University of Otago um, far more, far longer ago than either of us choose to remember. Um, but Kevin uh, has had a really, um, well, I thought really fascinating ecological uh, training in history. Um, so he's obviously from the US, as will become evident when he starts speaking in just a minute, and that's an accent that hasn't gone away. Um, but he then did his master's and his PhD work at um, uh, Virginia Tech. And you may know that Virginia Tech was absolutely the engine room of limnology, freshwater ecology in the US for decades. And um, I don't think he's talking about it, but I know he's not talking about it today. But um, Kevin did some amazing work on Steiger fauna and, and cave based food webs uh, in the US. So really, really neat stuff. Um, he's then had a career which has taken him, as I mentioned, to Otago University, where he's a postdoctoral fellow, back to the US, and then finally back to New Zealand, um, back to the University of Auckland, where he's now an associate professor. Uh, and uh, Kevin works on a wide range of questions around freshwater ecology and limnology. So I think today he's particularly focusing on the work that they've been doing around climate change and the effects of climate change on freshwater ecosystems. Um, so it's a great pleasure to have you here, Kevin, and great to see you again. And I'll pass over to you for your talk. Kia ora tato. Hello, everyone. Thanks very much, Ross, for the introduction. Um, and thanks very much for having me. Um, of course, I'm sure we'd all rather be doing it in person, but I guess we're all used to, to doing this by, by Zoom. Um, I'll go ahead and screen share here. And we can get rolling. Yeah. Here I get myself sorted and we'll get started. Excellent. Um, so I've got my chat window open. So if you have questions or whatever, by all means, um, I'm happy to have this interactive. If you want to pop things in the chat, I'll keep an eye on it. Um, but I'm going to talk to you a bit about, about some work that we've been doing over the past few years. And this has been a big collaborative project. And I'll introduce you to a number of people that have been involved to it as I go through the slides. Um, but this is very much, the, the work that you hear is very much a, a product of all the really hardworking people that I've been working with and not, not so much by me. Um, but what I want to do is just tell you um, a story about a little fish. Um, it's a fairly innocuous little fish, but it has a pretty big history and an interesting history um, entangled with humans. I suspect many of you are familiar with it. So these are mosquito fish, little guppy-like fish. And you've got them over in Australia. You probably recognize them mostly um, as a noxious invader. Um, but I suspect you've at least heard of them. Um, they started off just as sort of a, um, a, a side note in ecology. They, they were first described in the, the mid 1800s, the latter 1800s. Um, and the initial focus on them really was just a side note that they were sort of a small innocuous guppy-like fish that was largely food for bigger fish. Um, so there wasn't a whole lot to, their, um, to the origins of these, these fish, at least when people first started to, to study them. Um, but they started to gain more attention um, in the latter part of the, the 1800s uh, when people realized that mosquitoes were the vectors for malaria. Um, and so there was a lot of interest at the time to, to try to deal with those populations of mosquitoes, either by engineering systems to drain the water out of them or adding things like oil and kerosene to systems to get rid of them. Um, but also there was some growing uh, interest in using uh, biocontrol, so using fish to try to control mosquito, mosquito populations. Um, and as you can guess from the name, the mosquito fish, these little fish commonly will eat mosquitoes. And so people latched onto the notion that, well, perhaps we could use them to, to control mosquito populations. <clears throat> and so in the early days, some of the early um, uh, work was done by several different people, Jordan, uh, Smith, and Seal. Um, they were the first ones to sort of uh, suggest the notion of this and then started introducing these mosquito fish into places in New Jersey and the States, and then they were moved over to Hawaii. Um, they're, they're indigenous to the, the southern, sort of southern eastern part of the, of the United States. Um, and that idea was sort of picked up and the fish started to be moved further and further abroad. Um, so places like the Rockefeller Institute uh, the Red Cross started moving, uh, moving these fish around uh, to try to control mosquito populations. And that sort of continued and expanded. Um, they were introduced into Australia around 1925, um, but then they were also widely spread by the Australian Army um, around World War II. 
And so they were they're quite commonly used. Things like DDT started to take over a bit, um, uh, but still these, these fish were commonly moved around to try to control uh, mosquito populations. <clears throat> it wasn't until sort of the mid uh, 1960s that people started thinking a bit more about some of the potential problems with moving these fish around and the notion that um, they, can, they can cause problems as invaders. Um, and so Myers in 1965 first publishes a, a paper of Gambusi, the fish destroyer. And so these little fish have also been called things like plague minnows, for example. And so there was growing recognition of the potential problems that were caused by them as invaders. And so the, the perspective on these fish you know, from a, a human side has continued with the use of them as biocontrol. They're still commonly spread around. But they were commonly then thought of as a, an example of an invasive species. But they've also been used a lot in uh, a variety of other um, uh, areas of science. And so Herbert's classic work uh, back in the 1970s de demonstrating trophic cascades used mosquito fish um, in his experiments. Uh, and so they, they played a key role in some of the seminal work that was done in ecology, at least some ecological theories. Uh, they've been used as models for evolution. Um, they've been used in models in physiology and behavior. There's a genome published for them now. Um, and in fact, they've become a sort of a central fish in, uh, in science and in many, many different sort of areas. And so they've got this sort of funny tangled history with humanity. Um, this little, little statue here is in Sochi, Russia. So this is a, a a, a statue that was erected in honor of these fish as a, a biocontrol agent uh, overseas. And so they've gone from these sort of cryptic little fish in swamps in the southern US to sort of this globally recognized uh, fish. This is a, a map of sort of the current distribution um, from, from a large um, biodiversity base. Um, they started off in the, the southern and, and southeastern part of the United States, and they've simply since been moved all over the place. So you're, you're hard pressed to, to not find them in many places on the planet. So they've, they've been moved all over. Uh, there are two recognized species and now. There have been various arguments of whether they're one or, or two species, but there's the Western mosquito fish, which is Gambusia apinus, which is the one I'll talk about. Um, and so they're um, native to sort of the, the southern part of the United States over in towards Texas. Um, and then there's Gambusia holbrookii, which is the Eastern mosquito fish, which is over on the, the Eastern side of the Southern part of the United States. <clears throat> you find the Western mosquito fish throughout the United States now, down through South America, Southern Africa, and through Asia. And that's what we have uh, here in uh, New Zealand. Uh, the Eastern mosquito fish, uh, Gambusia holbrookii, is more common in Europe, uh, Northern Africa. And of course, that's, uh, that's what you've got over in, in Australia. And that's just the vagaries of the history of how these fish uh, came to be moved about. Again, as I mentioned, they're still commonly um, distributed around for mosquito control. And so it's not unusual to see um, examples of news articles like this. And so they're, they're still widely used. I'm gonna talk about populations in California that we used. They're still, they're still sort of farmed and raised there and distributed around the state for mosquito control. And so even though they've been recognized as an invader, this is, this is still a common application for mosquito control. Again, that recognition of the of these fish as potential um, problems that has grown. And so here's just an example. This is, was published in Science um, a little while back. And uh, it's focusing on guppies, which are, are similar to mosquito fish. They fall in the same category, but, but the recognition that um, you know, moving these, these animals around from mosquito controls may not be such a great idea. Um, we've done a bit of work with them in that context, just simply as an invader. Um, so there's just one example. So Finley was a, a master's student and a PhD student here at the University of Auckland. We worked with me and George Perry. Uh, and then, for example, looked at these fish and, and sort of realized that as we convert land, the landscape to, to agriculture and we change streams in the typical ways that we change in, in agricultural systems, we actually facilitate the invasion and spread of these invaders at the same time. So in a way, we've been, we've been farming these invaders as much as we've been farming cattle in some, some ways. Um, but I'm not gonna talk about them so much in the context um, of, of them as an invader. What I wanna focus on them is on is a, a model for evolution. And we've been looking at them as a model for evolutionary responses to warming. And we're doing that in part because they're a really nice model because of as they've been spread around the planet, they've repeatedly invaded systems across wide thermal gradients. And so we have, have populations of invaded systems across thermal gradients in a couple of different continents that we've been, we've been focusing on. Um, 
and we've been really sort of interested in the in this intersection between ecology and evolution. So historically, evolution has been thought to be this long, slow process that takes centuries or thousands of years to occur. Uh, ecology is a process that we usually think of as playing out over the course of you know, maybe years or up to decades or, and so on. Um, but there's been growing recognition that, in fact, uh, organisms can evolve in contemporary time on short time scales that interact with ecological uh, processes. And there have been a bunch of fish that have been used as models for this. And so these, these are sort of preceded Gambusia as a model. So uh, the, the guppies in Trinidad, for example, have been used as models for rapid evolution in response to changes in predation regimes. Now the sticklebacks here on the right-hand side, um, examine them in the context of um, contemporary divergence into say benthic and or littoral and pelagic morphs within like systems in response to a variety of other uh, environmental changes. And then finally on the bottom left here, this is an alewife. So they've been, they've been examined as models for contemporary evolution in the context of uh, land locking what's, what were once uh, sea lion populations of fish, for example. And so Gambusi is just another model uh, system that we've, we've been using to try to look at this intersection between uh, evolution on short time scales and what are and some of the potential ecological consequences of that evolution. And so as we as we think about warming and we think about climate change, um, it's, it's more than just warming, of course. And one of the key things that's been suggested that will be a consequence of climate change is a shift towards smaller individuals. And so there are a variety of reasons uh, for this. So this is tied into things like uh, Bergman's rule, James's rule, the temperature size rule, for example. Um, it's made predictions that as we warm systems uh, in the future, we're likely to favor smaller and smaller organisms. Yeah. And so it's not universal, but it's actually been fairly commonly demonstrated that this, uh, this can occur. And so since we're looking at temperature and size, one of the things that we um, you know, sort of latched onto a little bit as a way to frame our research um, has been by looking at metabolic theory and ecology. Um, so I guess many of you are familiar with it, but, but basically it's, it's a um, links metabolic rates in organisms, and we're interested in it from an ecological context because that ties into energy demand by, by organisms. It links metabolic rates to body size, and it also links them to temperature in reasonably predictable ways. And so according to metabolic theory, uh, body size typically scales uh, with metabolic rate at three-quarter power. So it's not a one-to-one -one change. So basically smaller uh, organisms have higher metabolic rates per unit mass than the large organisms. And then finally, it also metabolic rate also scales with temperature. And so if we normalize metabolic rate by temperature and we look at that rate relative uh, to temperature, we can see fairly predictable relationships between metabolism and temperature. And, and the expectation is this sort of universal scaling of, of metabolism at about 0.6 to 0.7 electron volts if we put it on an Arrhenius uh, uh, plot like this. And so it's a nice way to sort of link uh, body size, temperature, and metabolism as a key, um, key ecological um, uh, trait that's ecologically influential. So I'll show you some data that, that really focuses on these. Um, allometric scaling and metabolism with size, and then the temperature sensitivity of, me of metabolism is a, a key feature. Um, why else do we do this? Well, it turns out that metabolic theory, whether you like it or not, and lots of arguments over it, these four days, it's commonly used to try to predict the outcomes of climate change. And so just a couple of examples here. And so it's not unusual for people to take those universal scaling coefficients of three quarter power scaling with body size and and a typical expectation for the temperature sensitivity of metabolism to make extrapolations about what will occur uh, when we, we see a warmer, a warmer future. And if we're trying to make those predictions for future, usually the way people approach this is that we, you know, we go out and we take organisms, um, we, we put them in a warmer system and we see what happens. And so basically what we do is we usually take today's animals and we put them in tomorrow's climate and we try to make predictions about what the future is going to be like. Um, but we know that you know, future climate change, the outcome of it is gonna be a function of the ecology of the species. So the niche requirements, for example, how they interact with other organisms, but also how they can change over time. And so that notion of evolution on reasonably rapid time scales may modify um, what these species do and how the ecological role that they likely play. 
Um, so in a, in a perfect world, we wouldn't look at today's animals and tomorrow's climate, but we want to look at what tomorrow's animals look like and what they do in tomorrow's climate. And that's been one of the sort of the key focusing um, approaches that we've tried to take in some of our, our work. And so the way that we've done this is to take um, a set of geothermal systems in California and New Zealand that span a pretty wide uh, thermal range and use them as sort of examples of what tomorrow's uh, animals might actually look like. Uh, Gambusi were, were introduced to these, um, both California and New Zealand at roughly the same time. So they, they showed up in California in the 1920s and they were brought over from Texas. Um, they showed up in New Zealand around 1930 and they were brought in from Hawaii, which were populations that were also established from Texas originally. So this, this fish all originated from roughly the same place uh, early on. Uh, these two uh, newspaper articles are classic examples of, uh, of how and why these fish were moved. So this one was in the, the Santa Cruz Evening News. And so you know, they're saying now that uh, the first consignment of these top minnows known as Gambusi Apinus, renowned for their insatiable appetite for mosquito larvae, were just received by the State Board of Health uh, from Austin, Texas. And the one on the right-hand side here, we've got Dr. T.J. Hughes, the District Medical Officer of Health, He's a passenger on the Merrimack, which is a, bit, a ship traveling over from Sydney. He'd been at a conference, uh, a medical conference in India, and he had on exhibit in his cabin a, a kerosene tin full of these mosquito fish that were, were being brought over to, to New Zealand. And so you see this repeated all the time. And so the historical introductions of these fish, you'll, you can, for most of the same reason, they've been moved around um, by health boards oftentimes for, for mosquito control. And so our, our California populations sit in the Owens Valley of California. So they're over here by the Sierra Nevadas. So they're basically one valley over from Death Valley. Uh, this is a desert valley that has a series of springs through it. Um, and this work was really started by Dave Brixel. And so Dave was a PhD student that was working in these systems. He went on to become a postdoc uh, working here in New Zealand. And he, he really drove this work. So what you see here really derives from, um, from Dave's hard work and Dave's interests. Uh, he was working with Eric Palkovic at Santa Cruz. So Eric's one of our collaborators. And so we've had a really nice dynamic between uh, New Zealand and California in this work. And so these are, are basically pond-like spring systems uh, out in the desert. Some of them are natural, some of them were, were um, uh, built. And so artesian well, for example, there's a pipe sitting here under this uh, shiny bit on the water. So you've got water coming up from the ground, uh, from groundwater sources filling these systems. And then Gambusi were subsequently put in, into these. And so they're all reasonably similar. These are all really nice systems because they're um, genetically isolated. We don't have Gambusi moving amongst them because of, because of barriers in these systems. Now uh, they become super abundant in many of these. So they thrive in these, these warmer waters. And so it's just a picture from one of our, one of our field sites. <coughs> um, the work in New Zealand has focused on um, the North Island. Um, and a lot of this work was done by, um, at least started by Emma Moffat. So she's a, a PhD student on the uh, project. She's been a, a postdoc over in California now for a, for a while. Um, and so our sites here range from you know, just south of Auckland down into the area around Rotorua and Tapo, for example, lots of geothermal springs in these, these systems. Now, many of our sites are, um, our commercial hot springs. And so just a few examples here. So Miranda Spring, uh, Alakari Spring here, for example. Um, and in New Zealand, they're more sort of, um, they're very slow flowing, but they're a little bit more stream-like than um, what we have in California. Uh, Arakawera is one of our more interesting ones. This, this spring sits on a property of a nudist club. Um, many really lovely, nice people that have uh, allowed us to access this. You know, they're, they're somewhat, um, disturbingly interested in the, in the research, um, but they've been really, been really kind of us to allow us to use this, uh, use this site. Um, just a couple of here, Wairua, this is on Lake Tarawera, and then here's Prawn Park. This is uh, up a, a, next to a geothermal system down by um, Lake Topo, for example. So one of the first things that we did in these populations was to go out and survey them. And so we've done a bunch of work that's just surveying wild populations to look at patterns in the wild. Um, and I'll show you some data that we that we, um, we measured from them, uh, focusing on metabolic rate. And so we went to um, ten of these sites: five in California, five in New Zealand, spanning a, a thermal gradient. So we're from about 19 Celsius up to almost 38 Celsius. 
um, collected fish from these sites, um, and then used closed system respirometry to measure the metabolic rates. Um, so basically we take these fish, we put them in closed chambers with oxygen mortars, and we measure the, the rates of the metabolism of the fish. Um, so basically put a fish in a chamber, measure the change in oxygen over time to get its metabolic rate. We do this on a number of uh, fish, so about 40 to 50 fish per site. We look at the relationship between metabolic rate and mass to look at that metabolic scaling. So we derive those scaling coefficients for um, for metabolism. And then by looking across sites, we can also look at um, metabolic rates um, across temperature regions as well. And so one of the first things to notice is that um, I mentioned earlier that, that a, a reduction in body size is a, a, a predicted common outcome for future warming. And in fact, if you look across our populations, we find that body size, both in males and females, declines. Right? So as we would expect, so as we shift from warm populations uh, to cool populations, like they get bigger and bigger. And it's really these large individuals that are, that are declining in the, in the warmer populations. Um, one interesting thing that, that popped up was in, when we, we looked at the metabolic rates for all these fish, so here we've mass corrected metabolic rates, and then we relate them to temperature, so a classic Arrhenius plot, so much like the one that I showed you a little bit earlier. Um, we find that metabolism is much less sensitive to temperature than is predicted by metabolic theory of ecology. And so metabolic theory predicts that we should see sort of a relationship between metabolism and temperature at a slope of about 0.69 electron volts. And we only see it about 0.25 electron volts. And so these, these animals um, definitely are far less, their metabolism is far less yeah, excuse me, sensitive to temperature than what's predicted by metabolic theory. And again, as originally proposed, this is thought to have been fairly universally um, in terms of scaling, but it's, it's now recognized as there's actually a fair bit of variation on that. The other thing that we noticed when we, um, we looked across these populations of fish um, was that the allometry of metabolism, so basically the relationship between metabolic rate and body size changes as we move across populations in a reasonably predictable way. And so if we start with our cooler populations, we have relatively low slopes, allometric slopes that tend to rise and push closer towards a one-to-one -one slope as we crank up temperature. Essentially what this means is that in these colder populations, uh, smaller fish have a larger uh, metabolic rate per unit mass than the big fish, but that difference between big and small fish tends to decline. And so we start to push closer to one-to-one -to -one, where we start to see similar metabolic rates per unit mass um, across size ranges. So in essence, what's happening here is that the, the metabolic penalty for being small starts to decline as we increase temperature across these populations. So again, not static like what we would expect for, from, from the basis of metabolic theory. Um, it may not seem like much, but that range in slopes is actually pretty large. And so what I plotted here is that the same rates, um, or same slopes for our populations. The blue bounds on here show you the range of documented um, allometric slopes for metabolism across Tuvios fish, for example. And so we can see a range in allometry of metabolism within um, a single species across these systems that gets pretty close to what people have typically documented across a range of species. And so it's a pretty big, it's a pretty big swing in, in uh, the allometry of metabolism in this fish. Okay, well, so, so what? Um, we, we see this differences in allometry, but what, what might that actually mean? And so this is a little bit of a mind exercise. And so what, we, what we're doing here is we take our coldest population that we've got at some given total biomass of population. If we were to take what metabolic theory predicts in terms of the allometry of metabolism and the temperature sensitivity of metabolism, and we were to warm that population up, what should we see in terms of the total energy demand, the total metabolic demand by that population, right? And so it's gonna increase, and it's increasing because of that um, temperature sensitivity of, of metabolism, right? So this is what metabolic theory would predict if we took today's uh, population and we pushed it off into the future. But we know, for example, of Gambusia, that that temperature sensitivity of metabolism actually is a lot lower than what's usually suggested. Uh, 
by metabolic theory. And so if we do the same exercise, but we put in what we've measured as the temperature sensitivity for Gambuzi, we find that that increase in energy demand by the population is actually a lot lower. And so it's quite a bit, quite a bit smaller. Yeah. But we also know that as we go across these populations, the size distribution within a population isn't static. Um, so we start to see smaller and smaller individuals. And so what if we take that observed temperature sensitivity of, of metabolism for Gambusia, but we also then take this population, we keep the biomass the same, but we change the size distribution to match what we've observed in the field. So what happens when we reduce body size distributions? You can see that that pushes total energy demand by a population up. Not as high as what we'd get with just the raw NTE and to e predictions, but that change in size definitely increases energy demand. Oops, excuse me. But we also know that this allometry of metabolism wasn't static. Instead, it started lower and it rose up towards one to one, where small got closer to being large in terms of uh, metabolic efficiency. So if we put in the full scope of adaptation in this model, and so now we take a population, we allow their allometric slopes of metabolism to adjust. We allow body size to decline and we use our realistic measure for temperature sensitivity. We can see that that pushes that down again. And so I guess there are two messages here. One is that sort of the general use of metabolic theory may not actually reflect reality particularly well when we see variation in these scaling coefficients. Right. The other one is that when we look at this sort of full scope of adaptation, what it suggests might be happening is that it's, it's reducing you know, the predicted energy of demand by these, these populations and allowing persistence into the future by, by offsetting the, the energy demands that we might expect to see with increasing temperature. So that's about all well and good, but when we look at these, one of the key questions we ask is, is the pattern that we're seeing, is that just plasticity? Or is that actually uh, evolution? Is that actually um, genetic change within populations? And so the way that we've approached looking at this was to take our subset of populations in California that span these temperature gradients. And we've done uh, common garden rearing with these fish. And I use the royal we here. Dave did the common garden rearing with these fish. And so what he did is he took um, eight populations across uh, the thermal gradient uh, in the California system. And we reared them at 26 degrees Celsius for one generation, and then took the offspring, the F1 offspring, and then um, took their offspring, the F2s, and put them in um, five different temperatures. Okay. And so we do this common garden rearing to wash out sort of any environmental effects. And so if the patterns that we see in these F1 and F2 generations match what we see in the field, it suggests that we've seen evolutionary change, genetic change. Right? So those fish that we've, we've common reared, um, we did a, a bunch of different trade assays on them. So we've looked at things like reproduction and growth. We've looked at um, physiological rates, so that metabolism. We've also looked at nutrient excretion. Uh, we've also looked at body size across these fish. So, so we look at more than just metabolic rate. We've been looking at lots of different things. And I'll show you some of the, the work that's come out of um, uh, some of that uh, analysis. And so we'll start off with, with um, reproduction and growth in these fish. And so there are two things here. The top row is gonadosomatic index. So this is the total body mass of uh, a fish that's put into gonads compared to the rest of its body. So the total, total body investment in gonad production. And then the bottom one is fecundity. On the left-hand side, we've got what we see in fish just straight from the, the systems in the wild. So these are what wild populations show. And on the right-hand side are common weird populations. And so if we look at wild fish, essentially what we see is that as body size go up, we see a higher investment in reproduction. So the gonadosomatic index goes up, fecundity goes up, but it depends on the temperature from which the population was, the system that the population was derived. And so we see that most strongly uh, for cold populations. But as we look in warmer and warmer systems, we see less and less of a benefit in terms of reproductive effort um, by at larger body size. And so basically, as we warm organisms up, we see less, less of a benefit of being good. Is that pattern due to plasticity or is it due to evolution? Well, when we look in our common reared uh, fish, 
we see a different pattern. And so this, this, this is a, a pattern of plasticity in the wild. If we look at our common reared fish, we do see evolution. Okay? And so in this case, what happens is that when we look at kinetosomatic index and fecundity, we tend to see higher overall investment in reproduction across all body sizes as we raise temperature up. And so we do see evolution in the traits, right? but it's, it's for overall uh, increase in reproductive investment. If we look at growth, um, we find a classic example of what's called counter gradient variation. Uh, and so here, if we look at growth across our rearing temperatures, uh, each color on here, again, are the different populations. So red is the warm population, blue is cold populations. We find that as we raise temperature, growth rates go up, okay, which is what you would expect. But also notice that as we go from cold populations to warm populations, growth rates tend to go down. Right? And so temperature tends to push growth up, but evolution is pushing back on that. It's pushing growth rates down as we go up in the morning. So a classic example of counter gradient variation in these, these fish. So if we sort of put these things together, what do we end up with? So if we look at these warmer populations, we find reduced growth rates, evolution of reduced growth rates. We see higher reproductive effort at smaller size. And so we see a genetic basis, an evolutionary basis for that downsizing that occurs as we warm these organisms up. <clears throat> okay, what about some of these other, um, other things that we measure, uh, these other traits? And so again, we also measure metabolism and nutrient excretion. Uh, we also measure morphology. And we also have done some genetics on these fish as well. And this work has been done by Javi Benavente. We just finished her PhD about a week ago. Um, but she took these same fish that um, had been common reared and she looked at um, metabolism in them. And so if you recall, I mentioned this pattern that we saw in the wild where we look at these fish as we increase temperature, we tend to find this allometric slope, the relationship between slope and, and uh, metabolism and body size, it tends to go up towards one. Was that evolution or was that plasticity? And so we can take our common reared fish. So we've washed out environmental influences by rearing them under common conditions. And if we look across our different populations, so our cold population here on the left, all the way up to our hottest population on the right, these are the allometric relationships between metabolic rate and mass. It turns out that we don't really see any significant differences amongst populations. Okay? So we don't see any evidence of evolution of these, um, this pattern and slope. What we do find though, is when we look across all these is that when we rear fish at cold temperatures and then progressively warmer temperatures is that the allometric slope of, of metabolism tends to rise. Okay. And so this is, this is plasticity. And so this pattern that we see in the wild of these, the, the relationship between body size and metabolism changing um, is due to, due to plasticity in these fish. So, so we, can, we can recreate that pattern of the same genotype across these, these different fish. Okay. One of the interesting consequences of the pattern that we get here, so this rise in the allometric slope of metabolism, um, if we look at animals of different size, we find that the larger individuals tend to have a higher temperature sensitivity of metabolism than do smaller animals. Okay. And so metabolic theory suggests a universal scaling coefficient for animals in general. What we're seeing is that, well, actually it varies based on body size. And so the plasticity that we see in these fish tends to reduce the temperature sensitivity of smaller, uh, smaller fish as we increase um, temperature. And so if we put these things together, we find that we get evolution of growth rates, reproductive effort that leads to smaller body size and populations. We have plasticity in the allometry of metabolism that reduces the temperature sensitivity of small animals. And so overall, when we warm these systems up, we tend to push them towards populations of smaller individuals of much lower thermal sensitivity. And so it's a product of evolution and plasticity of different traits within these, these organisms. Uh, we've also measured um, a couple other things. So we did the body, body shape in these animals as well. And so Javi did this by looking by using uh, geometric morphometrics. And so essentially what she does is 
photograph the fish. So these were all of our common room fish across our different temperatures. Um, you then landmark the fish, and then you can do an overall analysis of body shape analysis to look how overall body shape changes um, across uh, our rearing temperatures between our populations that come from, from geothermal systems on a wide temperature range. And so we end up with things like this, which is it's quite similar to a principal components analysis in which we end up with these sort of uh, overall works of body shape. Um, so for example, the top one here, this is representing a shift in fish from a fairly narrow body shape to one that has a much deeper, deeper body shape. And it turns out that when you look across uh, some of these warps of body shape, we do find evidence of evolution. And so the one that, that popped up most strongly, we see this both in female fish and male fish, I'll just show you for females here, is that <clears throat> if we look across our rearing temperatures, we tend to find that as you increase temperature, we tend to shift fish from a fairly long, narrow body towards a deeper, broader body shape. Okay? But if we look across our populations, we find that as we go from cool systems to warm systems, we tend to push these fish back towards that narrower body shape. So again, a classic example where temperature is pushing plasticity in fish in one direction and evolution is pushing back in the opposite direction. What does this mean? Well, we don't know yet for sure. Um, certainly it can play off in terms of things like swimming performance, um, probably predator-prey interactions, and that's sort of the next area of research that we'd like to sort of chase with these. But it's interesting that, again, we're finding this, this sort of uh, fingerprint of evolution, and it, it's becoming fairly common that we're seeing countergrading evolution within these fish in which we're, we're seeing offsets against the predicted um, outcome of warming. Now, Javi also did some genetics in these populations. Uh, so she looked at populations in uh, California and New Zealand. Uh, she used genotype by sequencing, and she was looking at, um, at SNPs, so single, single nucleotide polymorphisms. And, and I'll just show you really quickly a few of the outcomes that have, have come from this. Um, so if we just look at neutral genomic structure um, within these, these uh, populations, we do find that there's, there's pretty high genetic structuring, um, both within and between countries. And so these are all of our New Zealand populations over here on the left. And so basically these are all individuals. The closer they are, the more similar they are genetically. And so we can see discrimination between our New Zealand populations and our, our US populations. But there's also a fair bit of structuring um, uh, between populations in both locations. It's, it's been a mask, it's masked a bit here in this, uh, this picture. Um, but definitely these are, each of these populations are fairly genetically distinct. There's not a lot of gene flow amongst those populations. Now, she then took a look at those SNPs and she tried to see if there were any that were suggestive of um, adaptation to temperature. So did she find any relationships between some of these, this genetic variation and the temperature gradients that we have in these two systems. Uh, she used a bunch of different methods to try to identify these SNPs. So she, she, she put a lot of different models together to try to find as many as she could. Uh, she ended up with about 1,200 um, SNPs that were potentially adaptive, um, roughly equally distributed um, between uh, populations in California and populations in New Zealand. Um, but when you look at these things, only about 3% of them are actually shared between the two different countries. And so it suggests either that if these are involved in sort of um, thermal adaptation um, in these fish, it's either a small number of, of genes that are, are sort of involved in doing it, or we're seeing alternative genetic pathways in the two different places that are leading to a similar type of outcome. Okay. Uh, does any of this stuff actually matter in terms of the ecology of, um, of these fish and what they're, what they're doing? Um, and so we've done some mesocosm experiments with these same fish to try to see whether or not this trait variation actually matters. Um, and so this is, I'll show you some, just a little bit of data from one of the experiments that we ran. This was uh, Emma ran this. Uh, again, um, our, our final colleague here that I wanna mention is Mike Kinnison, who's at the University of Maine uh, in the States. He's been one of the key, key people really involved in this, this work. Uh, and so what Emma did was um, she took um, two of our populations. So she looked at uh, one of our hot populations in New Zealand and our coldest population. So she selected populations from the end of our thermal gradient. And what she was really interested in trying to understand was, well, what's, what's the effect of these two populations? But more importantly, um, 
does that play out differently for different body sizes? And so what she did was uh, take these two populations and she created treatments from each population of either large bodied individuals or small, small bodied individuals. So same total biomass of fish put into a given mesocosm, but either as three big females and one big male or uh, six small females. Okay, hey folks, we seem to have lost Kevin completely now. So I'll just give him a second to reconnect and we'll hope we can recommence. Hello. The power, the power just blew at my house. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> Literally in the middle of the talk, the power turned off. Look, in terms of, you know, the things that can happen, which involve, you know, sort of <laughs> naked family walking in the background or whatever else, a power cut is probably the least of the things to worry about. So <laughs> we will let, you, we'll let you get restarted. Sorry about that. Yep. So hopefully, can you see my screen and everything? We can see your screen. We're all good. Sweet. We're playing by yep. Awesome. Sorry about that. I'm hot. So I'll just run off my phone. It's all good. <laughs> let me back up just a little bit here. Okay. So anyways. Hopefully you heard this bit. Um, we're talking about doing these mesocosm experiments in which we manipulated our two populations, a warm population and a cold population. We created a, a treatment of large body-sized fish and small body-sized fish from each of these populations, right? So same total biomass, but either made up by big or small individuals. And then we ran them through um, a mesocosm experiment. So we did this over about a month, measured things like phytoplankton, zooplankton, uh, metabolic rates, nutrient excretion rates, greenhouse gas emissions, a bunch of things that we measure off of these things um, and focused on the outcome. Um, and essentially this is sort of what we're looking at. So we have our hot population, our cold population, we have small body size and large body size. And so we've got basically four potential outcomes. One is that nothing happens. Uh, one is that we get an effective size, right? A difference between the two sizes, but it doesn't matter which population we're looking at. We could see an effective population, but not of size, right? or we can get an interaction between the two. And this is sort of what we were keen on seeing. This would happen is that what we start to see is that when we look at these warm populations, body body size plays out differently um, in terms of ecological ecological effect. Okay? And so I'm not going to show you tons of these. I just highlight uh, highlighting an example. Um, it turns out that we actually did see these interactions between body size and population. And so in this case, for example, we see a classic cascading effect of fish in which chlorophyll goes up when we add a fish, by fish eating on zooplankton, which, which then um, reduces herbivory. Um, and we see that um, body size matters, but it depends on whether you're looking at a warm population or a cold population. Okay. And it, as we look across a lot of different um, metrics in response to this, we commonly saw this. So if we look at things like zooplankton biomass, phytoplankton biomass, even greenhouse gas fluxes, for example, we found that when we looked at a population that evolved in a warm um, context, the role of body size was quite different. And it even actually reversed in some cases, which was, was pretty surprising to us. We found a number of things that were responsive just to body size, but it didn't matter whether which population you were, were deriving fish from. Um, but it was actually pretty rare that we ever saw an effect or a difference between our populations that was not related to, to body size in, in some way or another. Um, <clears throat> we've been doing sort of then our final iteration of sort of pushing towards uh, tomorrow, tomorrow's uh, animals and tomorrow's world by combining our, our fish derived from our common garden rearing um, with a, er, experimental warming uh, within these mesocosms. And so that's work that's been going on and it's sort of a, probably a story for another day. And so I think I've probably tormented you long enough with my talk and uh, my disruptions and my electricity. Um, but anyways, I do just want to give a final uh, word of thanks. There have been a ton of people that have been involved in, in this work. It's really been a, the result of the team. Um, and then of course, thanks to my, my super enthusiastic lab group and uh, the funding that supported this research. Uh, so with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks, Kevin, for surviving adversity. And, you know, I guess that's the issue of living in a third world country, isn't it? You know, situations in Paris. We, have, we usually have electricity. <laughs> Sorry about Excellent. that. Excellent.
really cool. And um, I was on, I had the great pleasure of being on the original Marsden panel when this proposal hit the panel. And um, and so I got to see this pro this proposal as it came through. I thought, wow, it would be cool if this got done. So it's really just fantastic to see it coming to the end, having seen the very start of it all. Yeah, okay, if you have questions from people. I saw I'd turn a comment from Pete Unmack around Horrid Little Beasts and being Gambusia, which was predictable. <laughs> um, question, Peter. I got a couple of questions, I guess. So yeah, sure. just to make sure I have it right. So basically in warm environments, the fish don't get as large, right? Correct. So is that because they're not living as long? Um, we're not sure. It's kind of hard to age these little guys. Um, but we definitely see we definitely see more investment in reproduction earlier on, and we we see slower growth rates in those warmer populations. Um, whether it's they're they're dying sooner or they're just never kind of you know they're they're dying before they achieve those larger growths, we're really not we're really not sure. Um, the big ones, especially the females, it's indeterminate growth. I mean, they'll keep growing. The males sort of dead end. In terms of their upper size distribution, but yeah, I don't, I don't have a, I don't have an answer for you for that one actually. Yeah, certainly one thing I've observed just casually without actually ever measuring is normally if we find stable environments like springs or bore drains or that sort of thing, you tend to find larger numbers of larger fish. Yeah. You will if you're out sampling billabongs or something in other habitats and those yeah. sort of things. So, I guess the other comment I had was, um, you're kind of sampling from a than from an odd environment, right? So the fish has evolved in a highly fluctuating environment where most of the fish die off over winter and then they go yeah. nuts again in the spring. Yeah. You've sampled all these fish from thermal environments that don't fluctuate, essentially. They're stable all year round, yeah. which is a very unusual environment. Yeah. It'd be really interesting to probably look at some of the Texas gambusias that have evolved in springs and have been in constant temperature environments for a lot longer Yep. To see if they've done funky stuff versus a fish that's historically lived in extremely fluctuating environments. Yeah, yeah, we'd love to. We've always wanted to go back and look at some of the original populations. I think probably, I suspect a lot of those populations originally, especially in the southern U.S., there there is temperature fluctuation, but I don't know how much um, how much that plays off in terms of that big boom and bust in some of those locations. So I'm, I'm sure there are populations. It'd be cool to look across those different. The different variation in temperature because I, I suspect that rate that that exists both in their their native range but also also in their invasive range as well so. yeah so i think in springs and these sort of habitats in general you always get a pulse in spring just because the algae goes nuts the food chain mm -hmm. goes nuts. yeah you can certainly find things in some of the big springs in florida would probably be interesting examples but there's also yeah. other related species in texas that are only found in springs have been introduced to other springs yeah. well aren't endangered that could be an interesting one to contrast. Yeah, we've got in our California springs, we have pupfish in one of them. There aren't many fish in, at all in any of these, but there is, we do have one site where there, there are desert pupfish as well. So there are some, there are some natives that have had the systems as well, but yeah. they're endangered. So we don't do anything with them. So. Anyway, I admire if you're working on these little bastards. I hate them. <laughs> the only time I work with them is to kill them. Yeah, well, it's kind of, we don't, it's, it's one of the nice things when we work with them, we don't too feel too bad about, you know, having to, to euthanize them at the end, to be honest. I mean, you do feel bad, but compared to working with some of our natives, we never want to do this stuff with them, so. Anyway, enjoy the talk. Thanks very much. Yeah, cool, thank you. Other questions? I had one because I had a garbage truck go past and I didn't quite hear, I think, but um, why was it evolution how are you distinguishing between evolution and plasticity uh, in your in your home in your, in your garden experiments? Yeah, so essentially, what we do with the common garden, if you if you look at those populations across, you know, the, the natural temperature regime, you're never quite sure whether that's actually, you know, just a product of the environment affecting the fish. You know, the same genotype can produce those different phenotypes. When we pull them into um, uh, into the common garden, we essentially take all those fish across that temperature regime. We grow them through multiple generations under the same thermal conditions. And if the differences between those populations persist, we know that it's, it's a genetic difference between them because they've, they've been uh, reared through several generations in that same environmental condition. 
And so it's a classic way to try to test for evolutionary effects by getting rid of the direct environmental effects on the, on the individuals. Does that make sense so far? Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. I understand now. Yeah. You may. Oh, hi, uh, maybe I uh, missed some information, uh, but you mentioned about their uh, body shape changed uh, according to the temperature. So is there any advantage they can get from this uh, body shape change? Thank that's you. That's a great, yeah, that's a great question. And that's one we'd really try to try to figure out. I think when we did this initially, it was, we had these fish and we were kind of like, well, what, what are all the potential traits we could measure? What are some things that are likely to change? Um, and there are a couple of mechanisms by which temperature could change the shape of a fish. So you can get different organs or parts of fish that can um, uh, grow at different rates, for example. Um, but whether those changes we have observed actually pay off in terms of some benefit for the fish, we don't know. But I think that'd be the next one is to take those fish and ask whether those different body shapes result, say, for example, in different swimming performance, um, different, different um, uh, you know, ability to, to obtain prey and so on. So I think what you outlined is exactly the question we'd love to have a student do next. Thank you. Sure. Other questions? It's interesting, Kevin, the, the role of body size and climate change. So when we did a large experiment on climate change in invertebrates, we found you know, these massive and divergent effects on body size as well. Yeah. In insects, it was particularly important because the males were emerging because they were smaller, uh, reproductively ready to go. The females weren't, and we ended up with this disjunct between reproductively ready males and then the females emerging at a stage where they weren't reproductively active. Yeah. Um, and so you had this major disruption effect, and you expect really fast selection, obviously, for small body size when you yeah. see a phenomenon like that. And so I think that that question of sort of, you know, is it going to be small things that live, live fast and die young that um, that proliferate through climate change to aquatic systems, I think is really a cool one. Yeah. Yeah, I think one thing that comes up with these fish is that we're, we're definitely working with a fish. These fish like warm temperatures and they're definitely an adaptable fish. We'd love to play with the same idea, looking at other organisms that might not quite share that same scope. Um, either for plasticity or adaptation. So yeah, it's it's it'd be cool to play with these across lots of different taxa. All right. Do we have any further questions? If we don't, um, thank you, Kevin. That was a fantastic talk. I just really, really enjoyed cool. it. It's cool stuff. And um, yeah, uh, it's a great example of of that sort of interface between aquatic ecology, genomics, evolutionary biology. Um, all the things that we talked about in our recent retreat, but there's this really cool space that sits at the junction of aquatic ecology, genomics, and evolution um, that's uh, really neat to explore. And so it's a great illustration of that. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you for um, surviving a power outage in the middle of a seminar you're giving. Uh, the, no worries. the list of life experiences. Uh, and I'll thank everybody very much and see you back for next week's seminar. Cheers, folks. Thanks, everyone.